Good morning. This is the uh, session on perception and collaboration. And I'm Bobby Bodenheimer. I'm the session chair for this uh, session. And I just want to thank you all for coming. And we have uh, five talks this morning. Um, our first talk is Asymmetric Effects of the Ebbinghaus Illusion on Death Judgments by Hunter Finney and Adam Jones from the University of Mississippi. And uh, it'll be presented by Adam Jones. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that questions uh, for this uh, talk should be done on Slido. So without further ado, here is Adam. Hey, everybody. Uh, again, asymmetric effects of the Ebbinghaus solution on depth judgments. Uh, so this is work primarily done by my student, Hunter Finney, in the High Fidelity Virtual Environments Lab, High Five Lab at the University of Mississippi. So... Uh, First of all, the Ebbinghaus illusion. If you've had any intro psych class or sensation and perception class, I guarantee you, you've seen this illusion at some point in time. It's sometimes referred to as uh, Titchener circles. And it, it's a relative size illusion. How it works is you have a, a disc of a particular size surrounded by an annulus of other discs. They can be either larger or smaller than that central disc. And this produces a really strong... Uh, effect on the perceived size of that central disk. We've got an example over here to the side. I, I hope you can see my mouse pointer. Um, so in, in configuration A here, uh, that central disk to me, even though I've seen this illusion a thousand times, appears to be much smaller than disk C, even though they're exactly the same, time, the same size. And similarly, uh, disk B appears to be larger to me than disk C. So this is sort of your classic uh, Ebbinghaus uh, illusion. There's actually been a lot of work done examining this, uh, this illusion. <clears throat> uh, it's, it was originally cited as uh, evidence that uh, action-based tasks aren't strongly affected, if at all, by, uh, by visual illusions. And uh, a lot of the work looking at this has looked uh, at uh, grasp aperture as that action-based task. So having people and you see an example here to the side, having people reaching the typically the small disks uh, that are placed in the center of printed uh, annuli. Now, grasp aperture correlates very well to the size of the object that you're reaching to. For instance, if you're reaching to a juice glass, your grasp may be somewhat small. If you're reaching to a coffee mug, it may be uh, uh, somewhat large. But this work has been uh, somewhat hotly debated uh, in the past several years because there's been some, some conflicting evidence indicating that uh, the Ebbinghaus illusion may in fact have an effect on action-based tasks, including uh, grasp aperture. Uh, it's also often been cited as evidence of the dual pathway model of vision. Now there's a lot of other evidence for the dual pathway model of vision, but it's, it's the notion that uh, we've got uh, two neurological pathways for processing visual information, one dorsal and one ventral. Uh, one primarily handling where relationships and another primarily handling uh, what relationships. Uh, now, the problem is, and, and every study, including the one we're going to talk about today, has some form of limitations. And sometimes reality itself is the problem. Uh, so typically when people have been studying the Ebbinghaus solution, it, it's been under these kind of circumstances where you have say some some set of stimuli sitting on a table and you're having people grasping or attempting to grasp uh, a small but still three-dimensional disc uh, placed on a 2d perspective plane uh, so it's really hard to get visual information remove visual cues from a real world scene uh, for instance you, you still have a little bit of uh, linear perspective even though it's very close uh, you have uh, some stereoscopic cues because no matter how thin you make the disc, it's still a three-dimensional object. Uh, you have a little bit of head jitter, which gives you a minute amount of motion parallax. And even though all these are very, very small contributors of information, except the stereoscopy, that, that, that one's usually pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, it's giving you more and more information about the true geometry of the stimulus that you're, you're looking at. So it's, it's hard to actually test these 2D size scaling illusions in 3D. So what we're trying to do here is actually take a somewhat classic Ebbinghaus study and move it into virtual reality. 
And we do this in two phases. Uh, the first phase is actually in the real world and it's a size matching task, similar to work that people have already done in the real world using uh, Ebbinghaus. And then the second phase is a blind reaching task, an action-based task that takes place uh, solely in virtual reality. Uh, recruited uh, 12 participants for the study, uh, two female, 10 male, mean age of around 23 years old, uh, all with normal or corrected to normal vision. So we began with this uh, real world uh, size matching task. And uh, we did this to establish comparability to the previous literature. And what we did is we had people sit in front of a 22 inch monitor with a wireless scroll wheel mouse. And uh, you can sort of see uh, an example of our setup here. Uh, we presented uh, two configurations on the screen. Uh, one was our, uh, uh, what we call our reference disk configuration, configuration, which was uh, a disk of a fixed size surrounded by an Ebbinghaus annulus. And then on the other side, we had a disk with no surrounding annulus that you could then adjust the size of by scrolling the wheel of the mouse up and down. And uh, they were presented with uh, 24 different uh, configurations, 12 were large annulus, 12 were small annulus, and uh, they adjusted the size of that target disk to match the perceived size of the central disk in the, uh, in the Ebbinghaus configuration. Uh, we used disk sizes that were randomly varied between three quarters of a degree of visual angle up to three and three quarters of a degree of visual angle. And what we found uh, was, was interesting. Uh, First of all, we, we only were able to analyze 11 of the participants' uh, data. Uh, one of the participants' data was lost due to a collection error. Uh, but the results we got from the 11 were, were still pretty darn uh, strong. What we found was that the large annulus condition, uh, the central disk, was underestimated by about 4%. So it appeared smaller than it did in reality. And similarly, for the small annulus configuration, the central disk was overestimated by about 5.8%, so appearing larger than it actually was. Uh, there was a, a strong uh, statistically significant effect of uh, large versus small annulus on uh, matching error with a P of less than 0 0.001. You can, you can see in the, in the figure here that uh, zero would be, uh, be our, our, our zero error, so you were getting the size correct. And uh, for the large annulus condition, we had an underestimation. For the small annulus condition, we had an overestimation. Now, we wanted uh, the magnitude of these effects to be somewhat comparable. So we looked at the uh, absolute error of these and found that the, the absolute error between the two disk configurations didn't significantly differ, a P of uh, 0.486. So this gives us a little bit of confidence that the magnitude of the illusions were actually somewhat comparable. So we're getting about the same amount of overestimation for one versus the same amount of underestimation for another, which is, which is what's typically been seen in the real world studies, uh, usually along the lines of about plus or minus 5%. So uh, this brings us to the blind reaching phase, the VR part of, of the experiment. So keep in mind that Ebbinghaus is a relative size illusion. So we needed to establish a size depth relationship for our participants. Uh, so we had them go through a calibration phase up front. Uh, we had uh, the central disc, or just, this, the, just the, the disc of 10 centimeters across, presented at one of five depths, all measured in percentages of arms reach. So we measured their maximum arms reach, and the disc was presented at either 30, 45, 60, 75, or 90 percent of arms reach. And uh, they couldn't see their hand, but a red sphere was co-located with their hand. So they had reach in depth, and their task was to touch the disc in depth with the sphere representing their hand. And they did this a total of 20 times, each distance repeated uh, four times. So once they've completed the calibration phase, then we move on to our actual uh, blind reaching task. Uh, we presented two viewing conditions, uh, one stereoscopic and one monoscopic. And we presented three disc configurations, a large annulus configuration, a small annulus configuration, and a no annulus configuration. Uh, the no annulus served as our control condition. So our large and small would be compared to that control condition. Uh, we tested the same five distances that we uh, looked at uh, in the, uh, the calibration, the 30 to 90% of maximum arms reach. And each of these was uh, repeated three times for a total of 90 trials. Uh, we blocked uh, viewing conditions based on stereo and mono. So they either saw 
uh, the stereo, all of the stereo trials first, or all the mono trials first. This was alternated between subjects. So 50% saw one first, 50% saw the other first. And we used a restricted random shuffle to uh, determine the, uh, the, to counterbalance our stimulus presentation uh, so that uh, whatever stimulus configuration you were seeing now, uh, the next one will be randomly selected from all remaining configurations, but you'd never see the same condition back to back. And uh, what we found was that uh, there wasn't a significant difference between the stereo viewing condition and the mono viewing condition, uh, P of 0.95. So uh, we grouped those together, we actually pulled that data for our remaining analyses, and we found a significant effect of, of annulus configuration, uh, P of 0 0.002. What we found was really interesting. Uh, the, uh, the small annulus condition resulted in an underestimation of depth by almost 12%. So this is, this is cool because remember, blind reaching is an action-based task and we're seeing a strong effect of underestimation for that small annulus condition. And that's consistent with uh, the target size being overestimated, making it appear that it is closer to you than it actually is. An interesting thing here is that we're expecting to find roughly a 5% change in depth, uh, but we're finding a little more than double that. So we're actually seeing a... Um, a 12% versus 5% uh, underestimation in depth, so a stronger effect than we anticipated. Also interestingly, for the large annulus condition, uh, where we'd expect to see an overestimation of about 5%, we actually see an overestimation of about 1.5%, so very, very little difference compared to our control. So we have this interesting uh, mix of results here. In the small annulus condition, we're, we're seeing a strong effect, and we're essentially seeing very little effect in the large annulus condition. Uh, so one thing you might want to say is that the large annulus condition for, for this depth, uh, this, this action-based task, uh, didn't result in an illusion. Well, that may or may not be the case. We also recorded response time. Now, the cool thing about response time is response time can be used as an implicit measure of the difficulty of a task. How, how hard did you have to crunch on this before a, a resolution or an answer was found? And there was a significant difference uh, across our conditions of response time, a P of uh, 0.014. And what we found is that the large annulus condition and the small annulus condition uh, both had substantially higher response times as compared to the control. Large annulus of about 236 milliseconds more, small annulus of about 270 milliseconds. And the difference between those is, is only what, like 34 milliseconds, so a really, really small um, difference there. So this implies that both uh, uh, large and small annulus conditions required about the same amount of effort uh, over the control condition. So it's possible that the illusion was actually in play even in the large annulus condition, but maybe for some reason that we, we don't quite understand yet, involves more, needs more research. Uh, the large annulus condition, uh, its specific uh, conflict was easier to resolve than the small, uh, small annulus condition. So uh, as with, uh, with, with any study, uh, it's never perfect. There's always going to be some limitations. There's always going to be caveats. And uh, one of the things that uh, the reviewers talked about uh, when we got them back, uh, which by the way, stellar reviews, they were super helpful if you're watching. Uh, so one of the things that uh, the reviewers brought up was that the size matching task took place in the real world instead of the virtual world. I don't really think this is an either or situation because I, we, we kind of believe that we, we had to do it in the real world in order to establish comparability to prior research. However, a stronger argument could have been made if we did both size matching in the real and virtual worlds. Uh, that way we'd, we'd, we'd have more confidence that uh, the size matching results uh, were actually comparable to our depth matching results. Uh, but you know, that's what future work is for. Uh, another potential limitation is the number of subjects we had. We recruited uh, 12 subjects. Uh, more is always better. Now, it's not terribly uncommon, especially in uh, VR perception studies, to have uh, participants in the order of about 10 to 20. Um, but like I said, more is always going to be better. Now, with that said, the patterns we saw were quite strong. Uh, I think all of our significant results had p-values close, uh, close to or much less than 0 0.01. Uh, so 
the patterns we saw were, were, were pretty present. We believe that if we did have more subjects, that they would, uh, they would be stronger. There would be a stronger, um, uh, the, the results would be more clear. Uh, anyway, the cool thing here is that the Ebbinghaus solution did appear to have an effect on action-based responses, and it also didn't. Uh, depending on which annulus type you were testing. So this could be a, a potential explanation for the mixed results that other studies have seen. It, it could imply that there's a little more nuance uh, to the Ebbinghaus solution than, than, than may, may previously been thought. And it's also kind of cool that uh, the response time, you know, it did increase uh, quite a bit uh, for the illusory conditions versus the control. So there's, there's a lot of questions here and a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, so with that, I have one second left according to my PowerPoint. So I'll, I'll wrap it up right there and we'll, uh, we'll move on to questions. And uh, thank you very much. Okay. So, um, Remember that uh, questions can be asked on Slido if you have questions for Adam. And um, so, Adam, the yes. uh, the disks are two dimensional objects. What mm -hmm. would be the effect of making them three dimensional objects, where you get additional visual cues that might um, happen there? So, one of the things I th not granted speculation. Uh, but, but one of the things that I think would happen is I think the effect of the illusion would probably be weaker uh, because you're getting more visual information that's informing you about the actual size of the target versus the illusory size of the target. And that's actually one of the reasons why we, we wanted to test stereo versus mono uh, because, you know, all, all the previous work has been done looking at uh, stereoscopic uh, real world scenes. And so it's possible they could have been getting minute 3D information from their stereoscopic view of the stimuli. But that, uh, that didn't seem to completely be the case here. So I think the, the illusory effects would have probably been somewhat diminished if they were 3D objects. But again, pure speculation, more studies needed. Okay, great. So we have a lot of questions, several questions Ooh. on um, Slido. Did, so did you test for um, eye astigmatism and do you think that it has an effect? So we didn't test for, for astigmatism. Uh, we did uh, make sure that all of our participants when viewing the stimuli had normal or corrected normal vision, which, which then hypothetically would include astigmatism correction. But uh, we, di we didn't uh, screen for that using any particular testing other than verbal report. Okay. And did you present uh, at each instant two, con two control and small and control and big, or did you also show them uh, three at the same time? So uh, if you're talking about the size matching task, on the size matching task, we always had a, a, an Ebbinghaus reference side by side with the adjustable disc that you would, you would you know, change the size of. If you're speaking in terms of the blind reaching task, uh, it was only one configuration at a time. So uh, if it was a, a large task, a large annulus task, there'd be a large annulus with a fixed sized uh, central disc. The central disc, important to mention, uh, was always a fixed size. It was the same size it was uh, during the calibration phase in order to maintain that uh, size depth relationship mapping. Okay. And another question is, if you scaled up the large path to match the relative distance to landmarks in the large VE, would you expect similar performance to the large path in the small VE or would the increased distance of the path legs affect performance? Whoa, say that one more time. I, that was a lot of words. I'm sorry. Yeah, was, if you scaled of... up the large path to match the relative distance to landmarks in the large VE, would you expect similar performance? Yeah, I'm not <laughs> understanding that question either. Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and, and, and speculate about, uh, yeah. about, uh, about it. Um, hmm. So I'm going to say potentially we're talking about scaling up the Ebbinghaus stimuli to, to, to match the visual angle of other landmarks in the room. Maybe, uh, if that's, if, that, if that's what you're asking, that is a fascinating question. One to which I don't have a good response, but, but we might actually be looking into, keep, keep an eye on some future work. Okay. So there are several more questions on Slido, but we are out of time. So um, 
Uh, Adam will be available on Slack after the session. And thank you yeah. for those great questions. All right, our next talk is Effects of Deaf Information on Visual Target Identification, Task Performance in Shared Gaze Environments. It's by Austin Erickson, Nahal Naruzi, Kangsu Kim, Joseph Laviola, Gerd Bruder, and Greg Welch, all from the University of Central Florida. Uh, there's going to be a pre recorded video, but then Austin will be around for QA after it. Um, hello everyone, I'm Austin Erickson. I'll be giving this presentation today. Uh, I just want to start out by saying that I'm presenting this on behalf of myself and my colleague uh, Nahal Narosi. Uh, both of us contributed equally as primary authors uh, to this project here. Um, so AR collaboration has been a hot topic in augmented reality research for the past couple of years because it can bring people together uh, no matter where they're located. Um, but these type of collaborations rely heavily on social cues, both verbal and nonverbal. Um, the downside is that by putting on an AR headset, we're kind of limiting the amount of social cues that we can give each other because uh, you have a big bulky headset blocking uh, your view of your collaborators. Um, so you don't exactly know where they're looking. They could be facing you, but they might be looking at something way far off in the distance behind you. Um, so we suggest using different eye trackers um, and depth uh, sensors to regain some of these social cues. Um, so with an AR HMD alone, um, we're left with just head orientation of our collaborators. We don't know exactly where they're looking, but we know a general direction uh, that it's got to be somewhere in front of them. Uh, however, when we add on an eye tracker, it lets us get gaze direction. So we have um, a ray that goes from that uh, collaborator's head out into the environment. We know that they're looking somewhere along that ray but we don't know at which particular point along it that they're focused. Um, finally, if we add a depth sensor into the mix here, we can use that to calculate the termination point of that ray uh, and figure out exactly which object that our collaborators are looking at. Unfortunately, um, adding um, these sensors uh, adds a lot of error into the equation. Uh, we have to deal with the accuracy of both eye trackers and depth sensors. Uh, and then these gaze, visualiz uh, these gaze information can be visualized in a lot of different ways. So both of these may have significant impacts on um, users who are relying on this gaze information in their collaborative task. Um, so we have some prior work in this area and we have a uh, preset uh, scenario. Uh, so I'll go over kind of the scenario here. Um, basically, our participant comes in, he, uh, he or she puts on an HMD, uh, the HoloLens, and is able to see a crowd of eight virtual humans pacing left and right in the area out in front of them. Um, next to our participant is a virtual partner who is sharing their gaze information with our participant. Um, so that gaze is looking at one particular person out there in the crowd, but they're all moving at, uh, randomly uh, at uh, each at different speeds. Um, so it's difficult to tell um, which person it is. Um, to make things more difficult, this gaze visualization is based on depth. So it's going to intersect the first thing along that path between the virtual partner and the object it's actually looking at. 
So in our uh, graphic here, we see that our virtual partner is observing person D. However, person C has stepped between the virtual partner and person D, so it will momentarily look as though he's watching person C, even though he's not. Um, so it does make for kind of a difficult task for our participants to try and figure out who this virtual partner is observing. Um, so we wanted to reuse this task um, for two different scenarios, uh, two different studies, so which we'll present in this work. Um, one other quick point to bring up is that each of those people in the crowd has uh, three different fixation points uh, to simulate uh, a more natural eye behavior from that virtual partner. So he could be looking at their head, their chest, or their waist, and he'll randomly flip between those three points uh, roughly every 750 milliseconds. Uh, there's also a number that floats above that, uh, that person's head uh, that can be used by our participant to identify their selection. So they can say, oh, it's person number one uh, that our partner is looking at. Um, so for our first experiment that we present here today, uh, we investigated a couple different, uh, we investigated four different independent variables, uh, but we were mostly looking into uh, error types and error levels and how they impact our user performance. Uh, we also investigated uh, target depth, so we uh, set the target to be at two different distances in the crowd, and we also looked at two different visualization methods here. Um, so starting with our first two independent variables, we have that error type and error level. Um, error type, if we look on the left side of our screen, could be depth-based error, which means that the termination point in uh, the forward direction uh, would be offset so with zero amount of error, that termination point of the visualization stops right on target. However, if we apply a positive offset, it actually falls short of reaching the target. So it's hovering in space in between the virtual partner and the target. Uh, if we apply a negative error, it actually pushes that visualization too far behind the target. So it's way off in the back of the scene. Similarly, we have horizontal angular error uh, and another seven different error levels for it. So at zero amount of horizontal error, that visualization is again centered right on the target. But when we add uh, roughly one degree of error in any direction, it just rotates it to the left or to the right. Um, as we apply more amounts of error there, at, uh, plus or minus two degrees of error, um, what happens is that that gaze visualization runs the risk of slipping off from that target. And if that happens, if it misses the target, it will extend further back into the scene behind them. Um, so when we reach plus or minus three degrees of error, that miss is actually happening consistently. Um, so it's never actually hitting the target. It's just too far shifted to the left or to the right. Um, our third independent variable is the target depth. So while we do have eight people in this crowd and they're randomly um, uh, positioned in every condition, um, there are only two positions in the crowd from which our targets are selected, unbeknownst to our participants. Um, so they can be in either position one or two, as shown in the graphic here, uh, which come out to be 3.15 meters from the partner or 5.25 meters for, uh, from the partner. Um, we have two different visualization methods which we investigate. Uh, the first is the truncated ray, which is a ray that starts from that partner's head and extends forward from there until it, uh, until it collides either with the target or collides with something between the partner and the target. Um, so while it is um, hitting the target in this uh, graphic here, the lady in the purple shirt, if this guy in the suit and the sunglasses were to take another step forward and intersect that, it would momentarily terminate on him. Similarly, we have 3D cursor. Uh, and with the 3D cursor, instead of having that directional information shown by the ray, we have a 3D object that floats at that termination point on the target or uh, on the thing that is interrupting that gaze. Um, so we have a couple of results to go over with you here. Um, this is the accuracy rate of our participants uh, for these seven different uh, depth errors. Um, along the x-axis, we have the depth offset. Um, and for reference, we do have the participant and virtual partner shown in the bottom right to kind of give you an idea of what this gaze looked like to our participants uh, for each of these levels. 
So just a reminder, at plus 105, it falls short of reaching the target, whereas at minus 105 centimeters, it extends way beyond the target. Um, so these results are uh, somewhat expected. We see that at these higher offsets, uh, we have a decrease in user performance. They're making more mistakes because it's just further away from the target. As we do get closer, we see that we make less mistakes until we get to minus 70 and 35 centimeters, where they're at near 100% accuracy. Uh, again, at zero, they're at 100% accuracy. And that minus 35 centimeters for the cursor visualization specifically, um, that cursor is actually shown right behind that, uh, that target. So it's just right behind them. The participant has a really hard time to see that particular visualization, which is why we see that spike in, um, in accuracy right at minus 35. Um, we also have horizontal accuracy errors. So these are those rotations that are applied to the gaze visualization. So at zero, uh, we see that we make a couple of mistakes for the far targets, um, but we're at 100% accuracy for our close targets. Interestingly, at plus or minus one degree of rotation applied to that visualization, uh, we see our users are all pretty much 100% accurate. Uh, as we continue outward from there, uh, we see these spikes in uh, user performance. So they uh, tend to do worse at two degrees of rotation, uh, and then even worse at plus or minus three degrees of rotation. Uh, and this makes sense because those targets at three degrees of rotation often miss, uh, the visualizations often miss that target at plus or minus three degrees. Um, so the main takeaways here are that that angular error uh, does have uh, significant effects on our user performance, especially when it's at levels of higher than plus or minus one degree. Um, for depth error, we also see that at those um, uh, at the higher levels of offset, we do have that decrease in performance, and especially when that cursor is right behind the target as well. We also ran some subjective measures, uh, which compared that uh, truncated ray with the uh, cursor visualization, and we found that that truncated ray visualization offered significantly higher user confidence, um, significantly lower cognitive load, and significantly higher usability than that cursor. And we believe that that's just because of that inclusion of that directional information. Um, so I need to keep moving fairly quick here. Um, the second experiment we looked into does not apply error onto these gaze visualizations. Instead, they're always right on target. Um, we do add two new visualization modes into this, uh, this experiment, and then we reuse those same two target depths that I mentioned from the first one. Um, so on the left, we see our two familiar visualizations that we just saw. Um, in the bottom right, we see a new visualization which combines the two. So it's just the ray uh, with that cursor added onto the termination point. Um, in the top right, we have a new visualization called extended ray. Uh, and in this case, that ray does not depend on depth information and extend, instead extends way past uh, that target to a theoretical infinity which we set to be 20 meters for the purposes of our experiment. Um, so these show some of our results. On the left, we have response time um, versus these visualization modes. Uh, and what we see is that the ray and cursor visualization, the ray plus cursor visualization, offered the best performance for close targets. Truncated ray offered the best performance for far targets. Um, Interestingly, um, no mistakes were made during the second, um, uh, second study, uh, and this was because there were no errors applied to those visualizations. Uh, another interesting uh, thing to note is that there was no significant effect of depth. Um, also, the, they just our participants had an easy time uh, making their selections for this particular study. Um, on the right side of the screen, we see our uh, subjective preference for these different visualization modes. And what we noticed was that uh, our participants significantly preferred that ray and cursor combination than they did any of the other visualization modes. And we had a similar, uh, we had a similar graph for our participant confidence. Um, so the takeaways from this are that uh, our users significantly prefer and are significantly more confident with that ray and cursor visual, uh, combination uh, over all of the other visualization methods. And we believe that this is because it combines that directional component with that 3D object to focus on that gives you that additional depth cue. 
Um, we also saw significant differences between that truncated ray um, and the cursor visualization, uh, which again we think comes down to just truncated ray having that directional component to guide our participant's eye toward the correct target. Um, so the main takeaways from both of our studies here are that the combinations of the depth cue and the directional cue offer the best performance. Uh, they're also more preferred and offer more confidence for our users. Um, and one more interesting takeaway is that those depth errors tend to be asymmetric. So falling short of reaching the target um, is actually worse for user performance than when, that, uh, when we pass too far through the target. Um, so thank you guys so much uh, for listening to my talk here. I will be around in the chat to answer any questions. Hi, that was a great talk. Uh, so Austin, we have several questions on Slido. Um, so how accurate is computing gaze depth from binocular eye tracking data? So if you intersected left and right gaze vectors or vergence, could, could that remove the um, need for, um, for a depth sensor? Uh, yeah, in the future, it certainly could remove the need for the depth sensor. Uh, but at the moment, um, there are a lot of troubles to, uh, to 3D eye tracking. Um, especially when they're mounted on a head-mounted display and we have those slight movements uh, that uh, are just occurring from the head mount moving on the uh, participant's head. Um, so for the purposes of, uh, of this work here, we looked into something that was a little bit more accurate, which would be using those depth sensors that move with the head-mounted display. Okay, great. And then we have a couple of, of related questions. So. Why did you use a, a virtual partner rather than a real one? And, and does that mean that they were, they used just synthesized gaze information? Um, um, the, yeah, so uh, we did use uh, uh, simulated gaze information. We did this uh, by actually recording um, a gaze fixation of uh, one of our lab mates at a target uh, over a set amount of time. And then we applied that gaze information onto that virtual partner. Uh, but our main reason for choosing the virtual partner over a real partner is for um, uh, uh, methods of control. Um, with that virtual partner, we're able to ensure that his gaze is the same for every single participant over every single trial. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it makes things a whole lot easier for us when we're running the experiment. Uh, additionally, if we had a human in the mix for that, uh, when we're trying to investigate, for example, a horizontal error, uh, where we're applying that three degree shift to the side, um, I think a human participant would be more tempted to adjust their gaze to fix that error uh, than uh, what would happen with um, our controlled uh, virtual partner. Okay, great. Well, how do you think adding a real partner in would have affected the results? Um, I mean, you mentioned that just a minute ago, but w what would it have changed really? Um, I, I think that the user performance would actually improve with a real partner, um, just because they're able, even if they're not communicating verbally, um, they're able to adjust that gaze information um, to be more on target. So they can kind of account for any error that we're applying onto that gaze visualization. Okay, and um, I think the final question we have is, why uh, three to five meters? Um, um, yeah, so we, we based those distances off from the, the proxemics theory. Um, so I think the, the closer one was in a social space, uh, whereas the, far, uh, the further distance target was a public space. Um, so they're just common distances that you could be interacting with people in uh, uh, a collaborative experience. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's why we chose those. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be back in just a minute.
All right, we're back. Our next presentation is Live Semantic 3D Perception for Immersive Augmented Reality. Uh, the paper is by Lei Han, Qian Zhang, uh, Yinheng Zhu, Lan Xu, and Lu Fang. Um, Lei and Lan are from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. The other authors are from Tsinghua. This is going to be a pre recorded um, talk, and Tian is here, but he's having problems with his microphone. So there won't be um, a uh, QA after the talk. However, he will be on Slack to answer any questions or discuss the paper with you afterwards. So without further ado, here is the talk. Hi, everyone. This is Tian Zheng. I'm happy here to present our work, Live Semantic 3D Perception for Immersive Augmented Reality. 3D perception is a fundamental task for AR or VR applications. In advanced AR VR applications where users are able to interact with the real world, it is crucial that the system not only needs to know the 3D geometry of the scene, but also semantic information. Also, 3D semantic information is highly requested by robotics applications. As semantic perception can be used to perform complicated interaction with objects, as well as robust navigation tasks. However, Although 3D geometry reconstruction has been widely studied, 3D semantic prediction is still in a relatively early stage. Existing methods are either not fast enough to process a room-scale large point cloud in real time, or not accurate enough for practical use. Also, the computational efficiency is what AR develops care a lot about. Portable devices usually have limited computational resources, which puts extra limitations on the system design. So we already achieved a highly efficient, dense 3D reconstruction system from our previous work, Flash Fusion. It has a fast loop detection module and a global optimization mechanism to ensure both performance and global consistency. So in this work, we proposed a new 3D semantic segmentation method, combine it with our 3D reconstruction system, resulting in a combined 3D geometry and semantic perception system. We further built an AR application based off that and showcased the use of our system in the immersive AR scenario. Before we dive into our method, let me briefly introduce some of the popular methods that enable learning from 3D data. Since 3D data are so different from 2D images in a sense that they are sparse and they are disordered, which means that any permutation of a set of points represents the exact same point cloud. One of the solution is PointNet and various networks that are based on it. So the fundamental idea of PointNet is that the network is designed to estimate a permutation environment set function. PointNet uses a max pooling function to achieve that. So no matter what the order of the input, the max function always output the same value. So that solved the problem of disorderness. It is proven to be very useful in hierarchical structure to form a multi-layer network. PointNet is widely used because it has some good features. One is that it directly consumes point clouds, as point cloud is one of the most common representation for 3D data. And because most PointNet-based networks have relatively fewer parameters, 
is usually fast to compute. However, PortNet cannot deal with very large point clouds, so you may have to split a large point cloud into some small blocks before processing it. So this is a problem because we always want to learn the global information as much as possible. Also, the, the model capacity limits the learning ability as well. Another popular solution is sparse convolutions. Just like 2D convolutions, 3D sparse convolution performs 3D convolution on voxels. As the dimension increases, the number of operation increases exponentially. So it is very important that we take the sparsity of 3D data into account. So in 3D sparse conf, only voxels that are not empty gets involved in the computation so that we don't have to waste uh, memory and computation on empty voxel grids. So compared to PointNet, sparse convolution enables larger and deeper networks while it's not fast enough for real-time use yet. These are two popular sparse convolution frameworks. Uh, they are Symantec sparse convolution networks and the Minkowski engine. These are all great, but neither of them is able to be directly used in online prediction. This is where we start to optimize the sparse convolution to make it faster. This is an illustration for a single sparse convolution operation. This happens in a GPU CUDA kernel. Since 3D voxels are disordered, spatially close voxels may be scattered in the GPU global memory. So every CUDA kernel needs to retrieve the input from all over the place. They're not necessarily connected. So this forms a very inefficient random access of GPU global memory. This does not happen in 2D because in 2D they are all structured and continuously stored in the memory. So this is the major performance bottleneck here. In order to tackle this problem, our solution is to group spatially closed data points into small chunks. It is based on the observation that each input location is accessed multiple times when generating different output features in its neighbor. Therefore, by splitting the input space into independent chunks, voxels inside each chunk have a high probability of using the same input features for convolution. These input features within a chunk can be cached in the shared memory which has higher bandwidth by two order of magnitude than uh, the global memory. Now, those uncoalesced random global memory access only happens once. The rest of the time, the CUDA kernel just needs to retrieve the input features in a high-speed cache. So here are more details. This figure shows the sparse convolution of a single chunk. Since all chunks are processed in parallel independently, we just take out a single chunk here, for example. As you can see, there are n input and output features in this chunk, each with some channels of features. Here, C in channels, here, C out channels. We divide those channels by a number, let's say B. Each CUDA kernel generates B output channels in parallel, like this box in green here. Inside each chunk, there are threads running in parallel, dealing with B input channels at a time. Then iterate over all input channels. So you can see in each channel, these marked out parts of input and weights are cached in the shared memory and are shared by multiple threads. 
Considering that point clouds are usually unevenly distributed and sampled, it is also important to make sure that each chunk has roughly the same number of data points. We accomplish this by adaptive chunk splitting. We divide chunks in a three-level manner, each subdividing chunks that contain too many points into smaller chunks. This results in chunks that have similar number of points so that when different GPU CUDA blocks are assigned to process different chunks, they will have a balanced load. Moving on to our network design, we adopted the popular UNet structure and modified it using the cross-scale fusion module. A common UNet structure consists of a pair of mirrored encoder and decoder. They downsampled the input a couple of times first and then upsample it to the original scale. Instead of direct upsampling, we use fusion modules to incorporate features of different scales. It's essentially a spatial attention mechanism, making the network able to learn how to use multi-scale information. This is a single fusion path from the scale J to I-1. The output of the J level decoder is multiplied by A and B to learn about parameters and get element product and then upsampled and added to the I-1 scale feature. Each fusion module contains multiple fusion paths coming from all lower scale levels. Here we show some evaluations. Firstly, compared to the Minkowski engine and the original sparse CompNet, our method is way faster than, than them. And compared to the original sparse convolution, our method also gets a, a great acceleration in terms of inference time, especially when dealing with very large point clouds. So here, the inference time increase very very slowly when the number of points increases. We also achieved the state-of-the-art accuracy on the S3DIS public dataset outperforming all existing methods. Our demo further shows the use of such online 3D perception system since we know the semantic labels for 3D surfaces, we are able to know the material properties of them, which can, be, which can benefit AR experience. For example, when a virtual ball hits a table and a couch, the rebounds should be significantly different as the couch is much softer, making the rebounds weaker. And now we are showing the online 3D semantic prediction results. So all clips are shooted on, on a portable device, which is a Surface Book in our experiment. Now we're showing the geometry reconstructed and color the geometry. Now the semantic label. And now we're showing the uh, table and couch e example that I mentioned before. So here is with the uh, material, material properties. You can see that the virtual ball bounces weaker on the sofa than on the table. But if we turn off the, the material, then the balls will get bounced to the same height which is very not unrealistic. Here are more examples of such experience.
In the end, we want to introduce a little bit of our follow-up work. In this work, we came up with a novel 3D semantic instance segmentation method that uses the similar sparse convolution network. This one is also able to run online on a portable device. It reached the top on both ScanNet semantic and instance segmentation benchmark. You are welcome to visit our website for more information. Thanks for your attention. All right, uh, I'd like to thank Chen for that talk, and we're going to roll directly into the next talk. Uh, Chen will be on Slack, just as a reminder. We're not having a Q&A. So our next talk is Dyadic Acquisition of Survey Knowledge in a Shared Virtual Environment by Lauren Buck, Tim McNamara, and me, Bobby Bodenheimer, all from Vanderbilt University. Um, and Lauren is going to present from within uh, Hubs. All right, so um, my name is Lauren Buck, as introduced, and I'm from Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University. And the work is on the dyadic acquisition of spatial knowledge in a shared immersive virtual environment. So to begin with, I'm gonna give you some information that helps you understand the drive behind this work and describe some of the current work that's related to give a good understanding of this paper. Large scale immersive virtual environments have the ability to be shared by multiple users that can move about. This introduces a problem for virtual reality developers and researchers. How do we give users the ability to locomote, navigate, and wayfind throughout these environments effectively? There's very little literature addressing this problem, and there are three works known to address dyadic navigation. Two of the three studies listed here focus on the navigation using mobile phones, and others studied collaborative route planning using a map to navigate to a destination in the real world. In this work, we provide quantitative results that introduce baseline knowledge of how users navigate and wayfind throughout an immersive virtual environment collectively. So the assessment of how people acquire knowledge about their environment or spatial learning has become a tool that we can use to understand what best methods can be used in navigating and wayfinding in immersive virtual environments. Most of the research up until most recent years has focused on active and passive learning and concludes that active spatial learning is better than passive learning and that bodily cues give us important knowledge about an environment. There are multiple different stages of spatial knowledge acquisition. And in this work, we focus on the acquisition of survey knowledge. Survey knowledge is the acquisition of straight line distances and directions between places. There are some studies in immersive VR that have looked at the acquisition of survey knowledge in these environments. These studies are concerned with the effects of different locomotion methods and body-based cues on survey knowledge. All of the work up until this point has been done with individual users and not in immersive virtual environments that contain multiple users. Collaborative navigation occurs in everyday life and is a commonality, 
and it's important to understand it. We know from prior literature mentioned above that the quantitative metrics we can extract are robust, and thus we feel that it's a good idea to extend this literature to dyads with our own work. So literature on shared immersive virtual environments provides us with some information about how immersive virtual environments may facilitate high, higher quality collaboration. For example, there are results from some studies that show that users are better at performing tasks when they're given self avatars and they're able to see the avatars representing other users. Additionally, in some cases, object manipulation in these environments becomes easier when there are more users. However, users of immersive virtual environments don't always perceive them correctly, according to work on collision avoidance and affordances. Since immersive environments can be larger than room scale, which is the case in this work, an important thing to look at is what locomotion method best suits the environment. There are several different methods for locomoting about environments, such as redirected walking, which is a popular locomotion solution, applying augmented translational gains, walking in place, and resetting to name a few. All of these techniques can be used interchangeably dependent upon the design decisions made by the developers and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. So for our work, sorry, for our work, we chose joystick locomotion with body-based rotations, which does not require physical translation. This is because the users of the virtual environment are physically co-located in the same room and share this tracking space. This method of locomotion has been used in several prior studies. So now I'm gonna talk about our experiment and the results that we found. We had a total of 32 people that made up 16 dyads that participated in our study. All users were given their own HTC Vive Pro and handheld controllers. They were given gender matched self avatars that were driven by the final IK plugin for Unity. These avatars are pictured here with the male on the left and female on the right. Users physically translated in the immersive virtual environment by using the D-pad on the handheld controllers. So they did the experiment in two sessions, one individually and one with their partner, so we could compare their performance together and see if anything was different. Participants always did the task individually first, and then they would come back for the second session in which they did the task with a partner at least the next or several days later. In the experiment, they nav navigated about a virtual maze in which there were eight objects. In each session, the maze was different. The objects were scrambled and the maze itself was reflected. The first maze, which was seen by individuals, is shown here now. And then the second maze is now shown. This was seen by dyads. In both sessions, participants were given 10 minutes to explore the virtual maze, and they were asked to memorize the locations of the objects to the best of their ability. They were allowed to take breaks as needed. Once the 10 minutes was completed, they then started the testing phase. Users were placed in an object for each trial, and they were then transported to a desert plane and asked to orient themselves in the direction of a target object, and then walk a straight line to where they estimated the target object was. So this is the desert plane that users were placed in during this phase. They did this for a total of 40 trials before completing the experiment. When they did this experiment as a dyad, they performed the exact same task, but were just asked to do so by collaborating and orienting and walking the distance together to target objects. They were encouraged to form strategies and communicate as much as they needed. To assess the acquisition of spatial knowledge, we use three metrics. The first being recall time. Recall time here is just defined as the time that it took the participant to recall the location of the target object and begin walking. We also measured angular error, which is similar to a classic pointing task in which we calculated the angle between the direction the user was facing when they began walking and where the actual target object was. Finally, we measured the estimated path length for the distance that users walked when they were traveling towards the target object. 
To analyze our data across all metrics, we chose Man Whitney U test. This is because our dependent measures were the average performance of the individuals in dyads, and the sample size was always larger for individuals. Additionally, a Shapiro Wilk test revealed that our data was not normal. We additionally compared the standard deviations to understand the variability in performance of the individuals and dyads. Looking at angular error, there was a significant difference between the average angular errors of the individuals and dyads, which were 65 and 51 degrees respectively, but there was no significant difference in the variable errors, which were 38 and 37 degrees respectively. The plot here on the right-hand side of the slide shows the difference in angular error for both the individuals, which are in green, and the dyads, which are in blue. That y-axis represents the angular error in degrees. To calculate distance error, we took the ratio of the actual distance to the judge distance. If the ratio was one, the distance estimation was perfect. Anything above one represents overestimation and anything below one represents underestimation. The average distance error for individuals was 3.9 and dyads was about 3.1. The top graph shows the difference between the average distance error of the individuals, which are shown in green, and the dyads, which are shown in blue. The y-axis represents the distance error. The average standard deviation for distance error for individuals was 2.9 and the dyads was 1.5. The graph on the bottom shows the difference between the um, standard deviations for the individuals and dyads. The y-axis represents the standard deviation. There is no significant difference between the distance error of the individuals and dyads but there was a significant difference in the standard deviations. The average recall time for individuals in this experiment was about 7.2 seconds and for dyads 12.9 seconds. The top graph here depicts the average recall time for individuals and dyads and the individuals again are represented in green and the dyads in blue. The y-axis represents the recall time in seconds. The average standard deviation of recall time for individuals was about 6.6 .6 seconds and dyads was about 12.8 seconds. The bottom graph represents the average standard deviation here with a y-axis representing the standard deviation. Individuals are in green and dyads in blue again. The difference between the average recall time of the individuals and dyads was significant, as was the difference in standard deviation. So now I'm gonna talk about what we found and conclude this presentation. The results from our work show that dyads assemble the components of survey knowledge better than individuals do. Dyads had a lower angular error than individuals and they also had lower variability when they estimated straight line distances. What this latter finding means is that although they didn't estimate distances differently, the dyads varied less in their judgments of these distances. The lower angular error implies that the dyads were able to orient themselves in the direction of target objects better than individuals. In terms of recall time, individuals spent less time orienting themselves and had less trial to trial variation than dyads. This finding tells us that dyads were communicating spatial information with one another. It could be argued that this result represents a speed accuracy trade-off, but individuals were encouraged to take as long as they needed. So we don't believe that the, this describes the results here. In addition, the angular and distance errors that were found in this work are consistent with those found in prior work. We believe that the overestimation in our work and in prior work is a result of the locomotion method since users of these environments have not been provided all of their body-based cues to complete the task. An important conclusion is also that the avatars and locomotion provided in this work didn't prevent the acquisition of survey knowledge. There are some limitations, however, to our work which are discussed in the paper, but we believe that these results provide a strong baseline understanding about how dyads navigate about immersive virtual environments. So on that note, 
I would like to take a moment to thank our funding sources, the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research for supporting this work. Thank you for your attention. And at this time, I'm now open to any questions you might have. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you think that uh, the variability in the dyads went down over trials, or would it if dyads were given longer to work together? Um, so, we actually analyzed this, um, and we didn't include the anal analysis in the paper. And what we did is we took the, we used the same analysis and took the trials by block and analyzed this to see if people were learning. Um, and people actually weren't learning between trials in either the dyads or in the individual condition. Okay, uh, another question from Slido is, um, was cognitive load and or amount of distraction measured in the presence or absence of a confederate? Was there evidence of collaboration via natural conversation? Um, so we didn't measure cognitive load, um, but we did record um, their conversation. Um, and we, like I took notice of what participants were doing when they were doing the study. And so they were having, um, they were talking about where the objects were in relation to where they were and coming to a general consensus. And I hope, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next question. But um, could the advantage for the dyads be explained by the order that they perform the task after doing it as an individual? Yeah, so um, this could definitely be something that would affect our results. And we plan to do a follow up study where we um, have the dyads do the task first or vice versa to see if this was an effect. But again, and when we did our analysis on learning um, over the trials that were blocked, we didn't find that people typically learned throughout the study. And also I did find that when people were doing the study, um, they would often get confused about where the objects were because they were still thinking that the maze was the same as it was in the individual condition. So it could have actually negatively affected the performance of dyads. Okay, great. And uh, you use gender matched avatars, but you think, you, do you think using androgynous avatars um, would have affected the navigation outcomes? Um, I don't think that would have affected the navigation outcomes, um, mostly because people were able to see each other before they actually did the experiment. So they familiarized each, they were familiar with one another before they did the experiment. And also, I just think that like body-based cues are important for communicating in the virtual environment. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions we have. We'll be back with the final talk for this session uh, in just one second. All right, we're back. This is the last talk of this session and it is design and evaluation of interactive small multiples data visualization in immersive spaces by Joe Yu, Arnaud Prezo, Barrett Inns, and Tim Dwyer. They are all from Monash University in Australia. And this is a live talk uh, and we are ready to go. Thanks, Bobby. Hello everyone, my name is Jia Zhou Liu. I'm a PhD student at Monash University. Today, I'd like to present about the design and evaluation of interactive small multiples data visualization in immersive spaces. First of all, 
a small multiple is a data visualization that consists of multiple charts arranged in a grid. This makes it easy to compare the entirety of the data. In small multiples, different data sets are represented using the same encoding. Thus, they provide an overview of the data, but also allow for comparison with minimal interaction and without overloading the visual working memory. As we can see from these two examples, on the left-hand side, it shows the development of the virus. The color indicates the change compared with one day before. In these small multiples, we can compare vertically for the difference between different countries on a specific day, or we can compare horizontally for different time series in a specific country. On the right-hand side, the green color means the cure rate, while the black color means the death rate. We can easily find a pattern such as Singapore got a good cure rate compared with other countries. On desktop displays, there must be insufficient screen space for effective small multiples. Research now has focused on large displays for collaborative use of small multiples. For example, in the InCube, the researchers use a circular layout to visualize small multiples, allowing the visualization of a large number of multiples up to 80. Apart from the small multiple size, large displays still only support the same flight grade layout available on desktop display. With VR or AR, other layouts are possible. Our design space investigation is motivated by several real world use cases of data with a natural 3D embedding, which is difficult to present on flat screens. The use of 3D visualizations for aircraft trajectories is very important as airplanes move in 3D space. In order to identify peak traffic period, the airport managers are able to compare the traffic hourly, daily, or weekly. In this example here, each visualization represents the aircraft's departure and arrival space-time track in Vancouver at Melbourne Airport. Another example is BIM, with the use of built information modeling format. Facilities managers have more and more opportunities to visualize data coming from different building sensors overlaid on 3D CAD model of buildings. Those sensor data include temperature, pressure, and carbon dioxide. In this example here, the model is from one of the Monash campus buildings. When looking at demographic data like population, GDP, spending in different areas, it is important to see both the temporal and the spatial evolution. For example, by years and by countries. The use of 3D bar charts in small multiples array allows for four dimensions of data to be viewed simultaneously and potentially for trends in moving more than two variables. While small multiples layouts have been explored in traditional flat screen implementations, there is no existing design space to describe such layouts in 3D space. In this paper, we propose the design space for layout of and interaction with small multiples in an immersive environment. We also implemented a prototype system allowing us to explore layout and interaction designs. We then ran two user studies evaluating the effect of introducing curvature such that small multiples wrap around the user. Regarding the design space, we identify four design dimensions that describe many possible layouts of small multiples for 3D data in immersive environments. For the dimension of the layout, a 1D display would be a single row. 2D is a traditional grid used on screens, while 3D is a new possibility afforded by immersive environments adding a depth dimension to the grid. Adding more dimensions allows more multiples to be compacted into a volume, but stacking the depth dimension will introduce occlusions. Curvature allows multiples to wrap around the user reducing the need for walking. While curving a 1D layout is relatively straightforward, there are several possible ways to curve layouts in higher dimensions. For example, curving a 2D layout into a cylinder or sphere. Aspect ratio refers to the number of multiples in each orthogonal dimension. For example, a 2D array of 12 multiples can be arranged in a ratio of 4 times 3, 3 times 4, or 2 times 6. Orientation refers to the relative orientations of the individual 3D data visualization. Similar to flat screen 2D layouts, one might align all the layouts to the same forward facing direction. However, with a curved layout, rotating each visualization to face the user may help them to more easily make comparisons. After exploring the design space, we plan to use a shelf's metaphor to provide cues for interaction. The shelf fizzles provide affordances for users to understand and orient 3D small multiples and provide clear horizontal and vertical alignment of the small multiples to enhance spatial memory. In addition to walking around the data and viewing it from this different pr perspectives, users can reconfigure the small multiples layout by grasping and manipulating different components of the shelf's visible form. Affordances for layout operations are revealed to users by visible handles on the pillars or shelves, 
which also provide visual feedback during manipulations. By grabbing both front pillars simultaneously allow the shelf to be bent, adjusting the layout curvature. The shelves can be adjusted continuously between a straight layout and a half circle configuration. By grabbing one of the front shelf pillars, the shelving unit can be stretched or comprised horizontally. As the shelf width changes, the multiples automatically rearrange themselves to fit the new aspect ratio with animated movements between shelf positions. There are also more more interesting implemented operations such as changing the height of each row by adjusting the top point of the front pillars and also changing the shelf's position by moving the middle transparent ball in the shelf. We also implemented several operations for interacting with the 3D data visualizations to allow us to investigate the use of small multiples layouts with data analytics tasks. To view the data visualizations from different sides, users can press both controller triggers to present a view queue Users can then manipulate the cube rotation, which is reflected across all multiples. Brushing allows users to select one or more data points on a single visualization and see the selection linked across all coordinated views. We provide several brushing methods. Users can brush a single data point with a pointer that extends from the controller. Or they can use by manual interaction of a pair of sliders on any axis brushes a range in one dimension. Finally, a bimanual gesture within the data volume brushes a cube-shaped region on all three axes at once. It is unclear how the layout of small multiples in immersive spaces impacts performance of users in a visual comparison task. So we evaluate three different layouts with two different data sites for such tasks. Our design task consists of a visual comparison between pairs of visualizations that are part of a small multiples display. To provide generalizable results, we include two common data sites in our studies. BAME, which contains data that has a spatial reference frame, such as a floor plan, and BAR, which is a typical representation of multidimensional non-spatial 3D data. We vary the locations of the multiples to compare within the grid, controlling for distance between the two that need to be compared. In a short condition, the two multiples are at a Manhattan distance of two meaning that participants can do the task with both multiples simultaneously in their field of view. In the long condition, the Manhattan distance were four or five. We also test three layouts, flight, quarter circle, and half circle. We focus on horizontal curvature, similar to existing large displays. Here is an example task in the experiment with the condition of flight layout, a bar data, and a long distance comparison. The example question is, in which year, Australia had more food consumption than carbon dioxide emissions. Participants first look at the food consumption chart and then carbon dioxide emissions chart. They need to use data analytics tools such as brushing and linking to figure out the solution. Here's another example task in the experiment with the condition of a half circle layout, BAM data, and a short distance comparison. The example question is, which sensor had lower temperature reading in July than in April? Participants first look at the BAME model of April and then July. They need to highlight different sensors to find the answer. For the measurement, we recorded completion time and accuracy for each trial. Participants' head was tracked during the entire experiment, which we used to calculate the distance they traveled during trials. Finally, we used an eye tracker to find the object they looked at. From this information, we count the number of times they switched between the two small multiples under comparison. Regarding performance in short, participants were faster with quarter circle for the BAME data side. No other difference was found regarding time or accuracy. The layout in the short condition probably does not impact performance. In long condition, participants were faster and more accurate for both data sites with flight layout despite reporting that they found they had to walk more. In fact, analysis of tracked movements revealed only a small difference in movement. For the qualitative feedback, Participants argue that it is less easy to find a position where users can transit between the two multiples with a half circle layout than with flat. Finally, participants stated that the flat provides a good overview of the data and that they can easily see all the multiples at once and keep them in their peripheral view when they focus on one, which is not possible with the other two layouts. The first user study indicated performance advantages of the flat layout as it provides a broad overview without the need for rotation, despite the need for some walking. We conducted 
a second user study to determine whether this finding scaled to a more extreme design with a larger layout containing more multiples from 12 to 36. We also removed the BAME dataset to make less conditions and more repetitions. We used the dataset inspired by the world indicator dataset used for the bar condition in the previous study. Each multiple represented the value of five indicators for five countries for a specific year. Finally, to better understand the effects of participants' rotation, we also included a full circle condition and removed the quarter circle layout. Thus, the three experimental layouts are flat layout, half circle layout, and full circle layout. Here's one of the two design tasks, which is with the comparison between pairs of visualizations with Manhattan distance of 7 or 8. The example question is for sector three, which country in 1990 had a similar budget as France in 2008. Participants first looked at the 2008 chart and then the 1990 chart. They need to brush sector three and make comparisons for the values of different countries. Here's the other designed task, which is finding maximum value for a specific bar. The example question is, which year did Australia have the most budget on sector three? Participants first brush sector three and then brush Australia. The only thing left is to compare the head of the bar in each small multiple. The answer is 2006. We use the same statistical method and take the same measurement as in study one. We cannot see significant difference between different layouts regarding time and accuracy. For the comparison task, this could mean that the better performance of flight in the previous experiment is countered here by the greater number of multiples. This explanation is supported by the fact that participants had to walk a greater distance and spend additional time in flight layout as well. Finally, participants preferred for both tasks the half circle layout. Their comments explained that it was a good compromise between walking and rotation, and that it allows for an overview at a glance by taking a step back. Participants identified that rotation in the full circle layout was disorienting and made it harder for them to locate specific small multiple. Similar to the half circle layout, flight was appreciated for its easy to access overview, but the amount of walking necessary was considered as an issue. Our user studies revealed that the performance of different layouts is dependent on the number of multiples displayed. With a smaller number, a flat layout is more performant, even if it is not the user's preferred one, due to the amount of walking required. With a significant increase in the number of multiples, the difference in completion time was less noticeable. However, participants complained about this orientation with full circle and that it made locating a specific multiple difficult. It was also an issue that full circle made, that made getting an overview at a glance difficult. On the contrary, the flat layout allows users to easily obtain an overview of all the multiples, but it requires too much walking. Regarding all these issues, the half circle provided a good compromise and was preferred by participants. There is future opportunity to more thoroughly explore the curvature design space, for instance, vertical curvature and the spherical layout. It would also be interesting to study the impact of interaction techniques that avoid walking, like VR teleportation or virtual panning of the shelf. However, this may also be less natural, disorienting, and may impact any kinesthetic memory effect. During the study, a few participants stated that the disorientation in circular layout affected their spatial memory to memorize the position of a specific small multiple. We are now running another study to examine the impact on spatial memory using different layout. And that's all for my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Do you have any questions? OK. Um, so. Uh, I have a question for you. So uh, in experiment two, um, participants spent more time looking at distant objects, uh, which you attribute to them stepping back to get an overview of the display. Uh, but did you measure the walking patterns because you could track them? And did you, did you verify that that was actually happening? Thanks for your question. Uh, yes, we uh, did analyze the motion patterns um, but it's not very interesting, so I didn't put it into the slides. Um, actually, we recorded the uh, 
uh, travel distance by the uh, height tracking and the eye tracker like for the gaze change. Uh, for the, so you are mentioning the second user study, right? Like for the second user study uh, of, like it is supposed that people will have more travel distance in the flat layout than with others because like they have to travel more to see in the detail, um, which is, um, yeah, which is also in the, in, in the, in the result. Um, for the gaze, for the gaze change that you switch between targets, we didn't find any like significant difference. Okay. So um, your first study took um, considered pairwise tasks and your second study was a more global task. Could you sort of compare the fact that, that um, you reached slightly different conclusions between the first and the second study that way? Uh, well, uh, thanks for the question again. Uh, yes, it's um, yes, it's important to like to make the tasks um, similar to have a like a generalizable result for both studies. Um, actually, for the first one, is designed by it designed for two different data sites, like for the uh, abstract bar charts and for the BIM data sites. So, like we designed a, like a quite diverse tasks. But for the second one, we only use the bar chart. So we want to have a, we want to minimize the uh, variance of the task, but focus more on the like on the layout. So on the performance of on um, different layouts. So that's why we have different tasks designed. Okay. Did that answer your question? I think that was a Slido question. So I think sure. that answers it pretty well. And um there don't seem to be any more questions on Slido. So thank you for a great talk. And, and that concludes the session. So at the conclusion of the session, I would like to, uh, I've been so concerned with uh, getting everything on time and everything that I haven't thanked all of the speakers. So I'd like to do that at this point for giving us great talks. And let me just clap for everybody. And I would like to thank Anton Franz Lubers for coordinating this session. It has, won it has gone very smoothly. And I would like to thank Kyle Johnson and Blair McIntyre for doing the online organization of this entire conference. I know they put a lot of effort both into the organization of the uh, real event and then in just a very short amount of time, turning it around to an online event. And so I'd like to thank them, but for, the purposes of this session, I'd like to thank all of the speakers. I think they did a great job. And that's it for the perception and collaboration session. Um, most of the speakers will be available on Slack uh, if you have further discussion for us. So thank you all for coming and attending. <laughs>